And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Studio M, previously responsible for for a lot of stuff with the sphere system, <laughs> Inclu yeah. including most recently most recently the the soon to be duology when it comes to the car when it comes to card casting. The one and only some some of you may know him as the Squid Baron. Some may know him as Matt Daly, but I know him as one of the brothers of this temple. How are you doing tonight? I am doing quite well, Mildra. Thank you for having me again. Good to be here. Thank you for coming on. And if anyone's wondering why my voice sounds a bit off, well, I, I've i been getting over a nasty-ass cold for the last few weeks, so there's oh. that. <clears throat> so... I suppose I should start at the or at the origin story. I already I already got your origin story when I had when I had you on for um Spheres of Ga for Spheres of Guile and and um and revised engine revised engineering. Mm -hmm. So since I don't want since I don't want to go over familiar ground a second time, I'd instead like to go over the origin story of Cardcaster's Gamble and and soon um, Counters and Control. Well, um, the original idea that start that started me off on this was um, when I was going through some of the older books in my collection, and I thought about one of the more bizarre mechanics that was used by the Crusader class back in D and D three point five. Um, sorry if that made folks feel old. Um, but that book is be the wouldn't be the first time I referenced in one yeah. of my earlier interviews this year. I referenced fucking sliders. Yeah, that one's like 15 years old. That book's like 15 years old now. But what happened was um, I got to thinking about how um, the class used essentially a deck of cards to um, determine what abilities you had access to each round. And I thought that was a really neat idea. And so I got to work brainstorming how it might work with um, the like highly customizable magic of Sears of Power. Um, I eventually like wrote up a draft for what would become card casting. And um, I remember just like writing up the whole thing when I was waiting for a dentist appointment. And after war, um, and over time, following many revisions, um, several delays. This was originally an April Fool's product for um, Drop Dead Studios, um, and eventually a lot more um, material that was added. I transformed it into the book that became known as Cardcaster's Gamble, um, which not only had a whole bunch of mechanics that were tied to gambling um, with some of the archetypes and. A number of the anti feats, um, and also like several of the thematics of tarot cards, um, or harrow cards, as um, Pathfinder's own interpretation has become no has become known. Um, but I did um, also the um, introduction of the spell deck in its original form. Um, this was a while back that I worked on this, and. Ever, in the year in the year since I originally wrote it, um, I've been playing a lot more card games. I've been learning a lot more about what um, spheres as a system is capable of, and this got me thinking that I could do a whole lot more with card casting than I originally thought. So this led to me writing up the first draft of counters and control that was mostly focused around a few feats, but the more I thought about it, the more I experimented with things, the more feats and eventually talents I came up with that um, incorporated different uses for cards and allowed people to um, try various different things with the spell decks that they could create. Um, 
Studio M was kind enough to publish the original Cardcasters Gamble um, earlier this year. And Counters and Control should be available by the time that we finish this episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I suppose, now given that one of the, fir- one of the first entry points with um, card casting is... Is done th- is done through the spell traditions. Mm-hmm. Um, I am cur- I'm curious what so- if um when you were te- when you were testing if you had made some pro- some proper um a proper card deck or if you had um if you had made <clears throat> if you if you had just used scrap paper at one at one point or use so- or ma- use something like the old magic set editor, which well, surprisingly it's still around mm-hmm. well actually the um i originally just like wrote things down on a whole bunch of note cards um but um one of my players pointed me towards the magic set editor and explained to me that that is a significantly easier way to do things um and i actually provide guidelines for um more effectively creating custom cards in counters and control. The book actually also has um, a bunch of blank card templates for effects that can be put on cards. Essentially, there's like a little like note sheet that like lists, okay, this is how much spell points you you can use. Uh, these are the talents slash feats that you can use, and like these are variables that you can change on the card. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now. With that, with that in mind, with that in mind, were there, because of the fact that we're inter- that this is integrated with the spheres system, were there any spheres that were a little bit trickier to to implement in the early days of the of the project? Mm, plenty. Um, it was there were a lot of early drafts that. Um, really didn't work out um namely one of the um early drafts that some folks might recall this actually did get as far as open beta was um an alternate system where each card would have one talent written on it and you would draw the card play it and then you would only have you would have only have access to the talents that were in play um over the course of the um over the course of the encounter that wasn't really enjoyable so we decided to focus more on basically making each one be a unique effect like for example um if you want to be able to throw if if you have the destruction sphere and you have light um like electric blast and the line shape like you could have a card that's a lightning bolt Mm -hmm. um or one that is a like not um that is a just a line of destructive blast or a cone of lightning, um, given that those are available with the same talent. And we felt that that system got a lot more dynamic and really lent itself to players having a large deck full of diverse abilities that they could enjoy like drawing up and improvising with. Mm-hmm. And of course, of course, even with even with that, you're still you're still using the same resources so it's not like somebody can just um hand it's not like somebody can just hand dump if they want to unless they mm-hmm. built around that well it is absolutely possible to build around hand dumping mm-hmm. um although the fact that you it, it does require actions to play cards means that um you're not usually going to be able to like play your entire hand in one round mhm mhm now with that with that in mind i'm when you first when you first pitched the idea of doing the of doing the interview and the sub the subject matter um you had you had mentioned that you that someone could use this to em- to emulate um emulate casting in ver- in various card games you specifically mentioned mm-hmm. magic and and yu gi oh um yep. were since you had mentioned that you were playing more card games in the interim for, between Card casting one and two. Mm-hmm. Um, were those the were those the two main two ones that you used to kind of get a get a get a better feel for what card what card casting is meant to be? Yeah, Magic the Gathering was absolutely the big one. Um, 
though some other ones that I looked into that um, are also go that also show up on the um, casting traditions page of Counter and Control are Hearthstone, um, Yu-Gi-Oh, and Flesh and Blood, which is a newer one, but it has some really interesting and fun mechanics, and mm -hmm. I also realized like could be the basis for some neat adjustments and some neat new options for um, um, for playing characters using some using an unusual drawback combination. Yeah. Now, something I could see as as a potential hurdle is, in terms of just build variety is you look when you look at a lot when you look at the way a lot of card games and a lot of well card game card game anime are are, are built around mm -hmm. um so ma so many of the so many of the characters in the in those kind of stories and even the kind of kind of setup that you see with magic with hearthstone with yu-gi-oh with card fight and so and so on is you are some variation of summoner <laughs> mm -hmm. you are some like you may have you may have you may have your fair share of sorceries, artifacts, instants, what have you, but the mm -hmm. bread and butter of, it, of most decks you're gonna find are creatures. And I think I'm I think one of the things I'm curious about is if someone could build a de a deck that was still using the deck system, but mm -hmm. was not but was not as reliant on constructs. That is absolutely the case. It is 100% possible to play a spell sl a complete spell slinger deck using card casting. Um, although, if you do want to like go ham with things like um, summoned companions, animated objects, and resurrected undead, it is totally possible to play those as well. Mm -hmm. um, the sample character that I added in, who is based off a rather well-known Magic the Gathering Planeswalker, um, is actually an Enhancement Sphere Specialist who focuses on creating animated objects um, and using, the, using them en masse to just swarm enemies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But... but oh, go ahead. That is far from the only way that you could play it. Um, anything that you could do with a spellcaster with spheres can be done using card casting. Um, it's just a matter of like deciding how you want to have access to your resources. Yeah. And when it comes to, I think we now obvious, obviously, obviously, since we're dealing with well casting, this is going to mm -hmm. this is going to favor um, spheres of power more than it is spheres of might. Especially, mm -hmm. especially since you're still dealing with spell points, and yep. um, might doesn't have that; it has martial focus. Mm -hmm. I think w one of the things I'm, I'm kind of, cu I'm kind of curious about is, it, is if, if some, fo if some folks have used this to do some sort of crossplay with some of the more traditional approaches to, um, casting traditions, like how, yes. like it, how, how cross compatible it is with. So with um, boon with boons and draw and drawbacks that are already utilized in ca in casting traditions, they are one hundred percent compatible. Um, card casting is a drawback, or rather, a series of drawbacks that mm -hmm. you can customize. Um, and they can be combined with basically any other um drawbacks that you want to do. Um. Actually, some of the um, casting traditions I provide are um, show examples of um, card, um, card casting traditions that incorporate existing boons and um, drawbacks. Like, for example, the Millennium Duelist, which is based on Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, let's see, it gives you... Um, yeah, it has um, card casting with the cooldown and deck out drawback, so you have a discard pile and you run the risk of running out of cards... But I also added in several of the um, several of the like conventional trappings that one would expect from like emulating Seto Kaiba or Yami Yugi or mm -hmm. whoever it is. For example, um, let's see, focus casting requiring you to actually like have a physical deck of cards that you play. Um, magical signs for to represent the holograms and 
also somatic and verbal casting to represent like you just like flamboyantly like whipping the card out and say <laughs> i summon dark magician yeah yeah um mm -hmm. but so if you want to get like really esoteric with them and combine things with like say defiling or um i don't know like I'm not entirely sure what the fluff would be on, like, basically you, like, using a deck while also, like, requiring you to, um, like, drink the blood of living creatures in order to fuel your magic, but given time, I could probably come up with something, and I'm willing to bet you all, um, could definitely make something as well. Um, my answer would be that the card is the one that's draw that's drawing the blood and not, and not the caster per se but mm -hmm. that's my interpretation yeah i've seen one really creative um interpretation that a fan had where they made their character a archer with a cursed um with a cursed quiver and the cards each represented a different arrow that he would pull out yeah um and truth truth be told if there the um frame of reference i'd use if somebody wanted to do this sort of this sort of card based approach Without mm -hmm. without falling into the summoning tra the summoning trap, uh -huh. is um, in is, is a Tokusat series called Common Rider Blade. Mm -hmm. Um, now, Bl if Common Rider over the years had has had different motifs throughout its um seasons and, and sometimes collectible gimmicks because, mm -hmm. well, because well it well. Merchandising's where the money's at. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but Blade's motif was that of playing cards. Each mm -hmm. of the four riders in it was kind of representative of one of the one of the four suits of a playing card deck. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, Bl Blade be Blade being spades, Chalice being um, hearts. Um, Garen being diamonds and Langle being um clubs. Mm -hmm. But the approach that that it had was since the the monster of the week were undead, which mm -hmm. had a category ba using that same card motif. Yeah, um, they can't since they're undead. They can't die, but they can be sealed and. Th those cards, those cards use the ability of that undead. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of the that's kind of the approach, and I'm uh, I'm not saying that I'd go one for one, but you but use that as an ex an example. in in mm -hmm. In that hypothetical, how would you handle the idea of um, sealing monsters into cards? Um, actually, there is a specific archetype that was um built specifically to do that um, in a previous book, the Soulbinder Summoner, mm -hmm. um, which is built around, like, once you defeat a monster in combat, you can capture it and you can use it later. I think that the Soulbinder fits very well with um, card casting, and I could totally see um, some interesting builds that incorporate that sort of style of play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, key th the key thing is that it's, it's not like... It's not like you're you, you're using the using them to su to summon undead later in this ca in this case you're mm -hmm. the sealed ones you you would use a um a bit a ability that it has yeah um soulbinder can do that to a degree but um if you're like specifically built around emulating abilities um the sphere arcanist or the interminate archetype or possibly if you want to be like more on the fly versatile um the mimic prodigy archetype can both pull this off very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I think the I think the the next question that I had is since since you mentioned that the Millennium Duelist was was drawing upon that was drawing upon um, Yu Gi Oh and especially early Yu Gi Oh. Mm -hmm. um, I I couldn't help but notice the dual runner, which I'm guessing is your five D's. Um, yes, it is my take on five D's. Um, uh, that one utilizes a um, 
I wanted to do something um, sort of unusual with that one by having effectively a um, casting tradition that is meant to be used alongside the um, Theurge feats for having mm -hmm. multiple different casting traditions. And that one um, incorporates the um, speed counters that um, those of you who watched or played during the 5Ds era um, may be familiar with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and of course, of course, with some with some of the other ones, I can see where, I can see where it was drawn from. Um, Realm Walker is very clearly supposed to be um, Magic the, the Gathering. The, yeah, Magic the Gathering with the whole thing with Planeswalkers. Mm -hmm. Um, especially 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 given all of the especially given all of the um the choices of dra the choices of drawback. Mm -hmm. Um. A hearth mage, of co of course, be of course being um, rooted in heart in hearthstone. Um, mm -hmm. I'm cur I'm curious if it was easy or difficult to make it to make the two distinct from one another because one could e one could easily look at them as be from a broad perspective as having a similar approach. Yeah, they do. They do indeed have a similar approach. Uh, the difference is mainly in how they track resources. Um, namely, like the signature ability of the um, Realm Walker is the um, is the fact that it's the only one of the tra major traditions to you um, to use um, colored mana. Um, you can um, take a drawback to basically have your mana only like provide re your the mana cards in your deck only provide resources for specific spells um and this differentiates it from things like the blood border which um like is more universally applicable with its mana um as befitting flesh and blood mm -hmm. um or from millennium duelist which doesn't really use mana cards at all in that it it gives you additional um drawback feats as a result but it does require a lot more Stringent resource management mm -hmm. from turn to turn. And speaking of that, um, Blood Border and Car and Card Crusader um, were those were those ideas that were that were submitted, or was there a certain thing that that they that those two were trying to emulate? Um, Card Crusader w was my um, attempt to emulate the original Crusaders um, card casting mechanic um, from Path of War. Mm -hmm. Um, Blood Border, meanwhile, is based on the card game Flesh and Blood, which has um, is a fairly recent comer to the tabletop card game scene, but has been making a big splash and does have some very novel mechanics to it. Mm -hmm. um, there were other attempts that... Um, I made involving like other casting traditions. Um, I've saw people like asking for things like card fight Vanguard and a few other um, card games that I'm not as familiar with. So, um, but I wasn't, I didn't feel confident enough like creating casting traditions that were deliberately tied to those. Mm -hmm. Like I, I could see myself asking about. About how one would utilize um, st stuff like UFS in the mm -hmm. in this setup, um, but that but because of the fact that that relies on a check system instead of a ma a mana like resource system, it it'd probably be tricky to work with. Um, when Duelist Two comes comes out, that'd be an interesting one to explore. Yeah. Um, which Duelist Two is prob is probably going to be one of the big comeback stories of the of the year, since mm -hmm. the original Duelist kind of got screwed over, but a bunch of fans had kept it alive, and then the original creators got the rights back, and now they're making a sequel. They've ar they've already kickstarted it. Awesome. Um. Uh, now. What I find what I find funny about it about integrating a card system is I remember I remember a comment that Richard Garfield had made at, had made at one point where he said that a um, a deck should be 
the equivalent of a character sheet. Now, taking that taking that into account and in how you kind of you kind of have a bit of a class system of sorts with the col with the colors of mana in Magic. Mm -hmm. At least you did to a point until we started to integrate some of the weird shit. <laughs> um, especially during the, I'd say I'd say one of the biggest cases for me of integrating the weird shit is, say the say, that that attempt to bring back Ice Age as well as the um, Mirrodin era, mm -hmm. where it was all, where it was all about the artifacts. Yeah. And well, the less said about slivers, the better. <laughs> I happen to enjoy artifact decks, but you do you. Um, I had a particularly infamous artifact deck that was a rainbow deck because a bunch of the cards and effects were stronger depend were stronger based on how many different colors of mana you spent. Mm -hmm. So I don't. <laughs> yeah. Along. Along with some artifacts that were specifically designed to. To constantly pump out one one um, tokens, mm -hmm. so you have a mix of sunburst and zerg rush. <laughs> fun. <laughs> oh, fun for me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I am a bit. I, but I am a bit curious how how one would how one would potentially integrate the, um the mana colors into card casting. I'll I'll uh, start with the easiest one and let's start with red mana. Well, um generally like what I um if you look into it, um I I hadn't um I had the sample character that I put in um mm -hmm. to counters and control is actually a um realm walker mm -hmm. um who does use um three different colors of mana, um those being blue, black and white. Mm -hmm. Um I Originally thought to tie them to, to tie the colors to specific spheres, but um, in practice, I found it more practical to um, have the like colors be like independently determinable from um, like any specific sphere, so that players could um, like essentially situate their elements um, however they saw appropriate. Mm -hmm. Like for example. Um, for the sample character, like I made like the minion creation, the counter spells, the um, card drawing stuff. I made that cost blue mana, um, which and even though it came from multiple different spheres, um, mm -hmm. the enhancement sphere material I split up between black and white because um, enhancement has the capacity for both like giving your side like various different bonuses while also um, inflicting debuffs on the enemy. Um, like most of the self healing stuff that I'm um most of the self healing stuff I made white um but I did space a number of things out and even made a few things dual color because you can do that if you have specific feats mm -hmm. um in order to um reduce their spell point cost um for example the um abilities that do things like Animating an object and inflicting penalties on the opponent, um, I had cost both blue and black mana. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the reasons that I didn't explicitly tie the spells to um, like specific colors is because I wanted to give players the freedom to develop their own dynamics between like what kind of magic spells would fit into what different categories and. During playtesting, I saw some pretty creative interpretations where people were emulating not just Magic the Gathering, but also other card games. Um, I saw one person b build a Creation Sphere character using five different colors of mana to emulate the resources in Catan. <laughs> and he would do things like, okay, if I'm going to like build a wall, I'm going to need like brick and um, uh, um clay and stone and he would use those colors for his creations for, for specific creation sphere spells whereas like other ones like his summoning he would use sheep and whatnot mm -hmm. yeah and i'm mm -hmm. guessing that's the reason why you didn't go with colors is be because what because what if somebody wants to use this system to 
have their own have their own sets of mana or it, or its equivalents that doesn't mm-hmm. fit into that five color um archetype exactly which is is kind of is kind of amusing because I, while I never finished it a long time ago I had made a um I had, I had made a bit of a casting system that was um mm-hmm. loosely inspired by the eight elements that you see in the um I Ching mm-hmm. um and it's specifically desi- specifically designed with um cr- with combo play in mind Mm-hmm. Like it to the point where it's physically impossible to to use just one to use just one element in that you ha- you're going to be using at least two. Most people are going to be using three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. But. I do, but when it when it comes to. I think there is one. There is one other character who I who I think can kind of fit in with fit in with that motif of a car a card caster, but not necessarily a summoner. And that is Ace from Final Fantasy Type Zero. Mm-hmm. Um, largely, it's lar- it's largely due to the fact that a lot his primary ability is all is cut cards, which is how he builds his his particular brand of ranged attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, some, sometimes using it to to do um, but to do buffs, sometimes debuffs, and sometimes attacks. It depends on what he draws. That's exactly um, what um, uh, what um, certain card casting builds would let you do. If you want to play, like, say, an Encanter or an Elementalist or a Soul Weaver, um, which uses card casting, you mm-hmm. could definitely incorporate all of those elements. Well, speaking of that, let's talk about the three archetypes that you have in in the in the book. The first one mm-hmm. being the card weaver. What what would you say is the type of char- the type of characters that the card weaver is meant to emulate? Uh, the card weaver was um, this one was not really meant to emulate a specific character so much as it was a little bit of a experiment with um, being. Uh, um, uh, it was meant to, as an experiment to see um, if we could have a character with more dynamic deck manipulation abilities um, function. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea behind the card weaver is that um, when they cast a spell, they can util- um, they can destroy one of their veils, which is a limited resource um, that also determines how many spells they can have access access to at a time in order to um, manipulate their deck or their hand or the cards they have in play in some way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... and... Oh, go ahead. Oh. Well, um, no, you go ahead. I pretty much um, said what I needed to. Yeah. And, of course, then there's the Fortified Spellweaver. That one was pretty much just designed as a way to emulate the Crusader um, from D and D three point five as faithfully as faithfully as possible. Mm-hmm. It's it was an addendum to the Card Weaver to effectively create a character who like use relies heavily on martial combat but still has a randomly generated magical set of abilities. Mm-hmm. Now. With that, with that in with that in mind, the last one that I'd want to ask on the on that matter is the um, prodigy, mm-hmm. the, pro, the um, card casting imbue. Yeah, that one was. Um, I've tinkered a lot with like how to um, integrate the prodigy, especially because I imagine that, given its ability to like cast extra spells per turn. Um, I imagine that a lot of people would want to play it in conjunction with card casting for the sheer thrill of like being able to empty their hands in one wild dramatic play. So um, I 
gave the players some extra tools in order to help accomplish that fantasy as effectively as possible. Um, giving them with um, giving them access to extra draw power whenever they um, completed links in their sequence and a finisher that augmented um, yeah that effectively gave them an extra card play per turn if mm -hmm. on the turn that they activated it yeah now mm -hmm. with that in, with with that in with that in mind um, I would you say there's one sphere that um, I've seen I've seen some people get a lot of use of and some people a little bit less so because of how it works is the mm -hmm. monosphere would would you say that with card casting monosphere is a has a bet has a bigger chance to kind of get the spotlight I actually incorporate I do actually I've seen the monosphere used quite a bit at my table. And I've had um, players and monsters alike utilize many different talents from the sphere to creative effect. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I do think that card casting does um, lend itself well to um, um, to like the manipulation of magic itself, which is why I included not only um, two magic talents for the monosphere, those being magic replication and friction, um, which are both based on some well-known MTG mechanics. Um, but I also included a number of different Manosphere options for um, many of the feats presented in the book. Um, mm -hmm. The Control Caster feat, which is kind of the catch-all for um, different, um, like, interfering with other players' hands or deck, um, has several abilities which are related to... The Manosphere, most notably, um, what are they? Facilitate the game, which um, basically allows you to kill a creature by decking it out, even if they don't normally have that drawback. Mm -hmm. um, lockout, which is um, essentially like it's it's about like forcibly removing. Um, it's about it's about hand drop, essentially, just removing cards from players' hands. Uh, mana targeting, which allows you to look at people's hands. And Pilfered Magic, which basically lets you pull the Ragavan stunts from MTG and just take the opponent's spells and use them against them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there's there's a few keywords in ma in Magic that I'm curious how you how you'd attempt to um how you'd attempt mm -hmm. to implement them within. With within card casting, mm -hmm. uh, some of some of the some of them are a bit are a bit evergreen, and some and some of them aren't. And s there's some yeah. that that I think I think would be a little bit a little bit too obvious. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. But I'd I'd say what I'd say. I was gonna bring up vigilance, but some, but something like vigilance or ha or haste. Um, you could I think probably we'd... handle that by giving the creature like specific feats. Like mm -hmm. I'd say that a companion, given the combat reflexes feat or the guardian sphere, would definitely have vigilance. Yeah. Would you mm -hmm. treat trample as overrun? I actually trample. I would probably handle as being something like the cleave feat or the berserker sphere, just being able to whack through multiple targets at once. Yeah, I could, I could, mm -hmm. I, I, I could see that. Um, yeah. And with some, with something like um, indestructible, I'm get, I'm guessing you would have it. You would have it that that would ju that would just be a mute. Immu immunity to any sort of, well, any, any sort of effects that would do that would be the save or dies kind of thing. Yeah, just like wards from the protection sphere or um, temporary temporary HP from the life sphere. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, one of the feats in this book is dedicated specifically to spending extra spell points on a summon in order to drop it immediately with um, a number of buffs on it. So you could um, 
use it. Um, you could effectively use that to like replicate a mon, like replicate like playing a single spell to um with, with to bring in a monster that has a whole bunch of unique keywords and perks attached to it mm -hmm. by spending a lot of mana. Yeah. Um. How would you how would you handle something like Bush something like Bushido? Would you just treat that as a feat? Um. Oh boy. I think um. Bushido could. That one would be tricky to handle. Um. But um, it is it is possible already to um summon a monster and just have it do something for one specific action. Um, and, but regarding, like, basically, like, having it, like, move in and, like, swap places with another monster before being unsummoned, I think that could be done using, um, using the Warp Sphere and the Swap Places talent, but, mm -hmm. um, actually, hold up. That? Might actually be possible already. Um, already with um, some of the stuff that exists in here. Um, so, um, yeah, summon capacitor lets you um, basically like increase the casting time to apply a whole bunch of your stuff to your summons, which is basically summoning sickness. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was one other talent in here that was very much be um. But it was very much based on the idea of. I'll find it later. Yeah. Oh, uh, but mo moving on from the moving on from that. Oh, uh, how would you? How do you suppose you could ha you could handle? Oh. Uh, the, I'd say some. I'd say for the sake of this, since I'm, since I already mentioned a comp, I already mentioned one ability that came from the Kamigawa block. I guess I may as well mention another. Oh, with... I, found, I found it. Titanic summons. Uh, ah. Mm -hmm. But how would you handle something like ninjutsu? Mm -hmm. Where, if you if you don't recall if you don't recall the effect of it because it was really only used with black yeah. decks. Mm -hmm. Um. The idea was you'd you'd be able to um, you'd be you'd be able to spend a card that had ninj a creature that had ninjutsu. You could um spend you could spend the and actually I'm look I'm looking at the proper definition so it's, ri it's written as ninjutsu cost. If you have a ninja in, in your hand and you can tr and um, you control an attacking creature that the opponent isn't blocking you can pay the ninjutsu cost mm -hmm. um return the unblocked creature t to your hand and then put the ninja into the battlefield tapped and attacking well it was, um, the funny thing it was about basically that a, is... basically a pay a pay mp to do a creature swap mm -hmm. the funny thing about that is that i um was able to um, replicate ninjutsu by accident because of um, a talent, um, a feat I added called Tribute of Essence, which was specifically meant to emulate um, tributing monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh. Mm -hmm. If you have the Mana Sphere and the Essentialized talent, um, you can take the feat Tribute of Essence to, um, as a free action, um, dismiss a creature and... Basic, um, yeah, dismiss a creature and then reduce the um, mana cost of another spell that you are casting that turn. Mm -hmm. So it would be absolutely possible to emulate ninjutsu by um, basically using a, um, using tribute of essence to like swap out your um, say I don't know like a ooze monster for a ninja creature that you would summon and which could then get an attack in. Um, how would you handle something like Storm? Oh, boy. <laughs> um. Yeah, that, that one's a tricky one, because I could see Storm get, I could see Storm getting out of hand really easily. Oh, gosh, it really, yeah, like, repeating spells is a tricky thing to manage, um, 
But um, I did actually create an ability for this, um, which is uh, magic replication from the Mana Sphere, mm -hmm. where um, you could um, spend an additional spell point to create an additional instance of a magic effect that you cr um, create, or four additional spell points if it, the magic effect is a creature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. Um, you... I don't want to do too much with recursion, but um, theoretically, you, if you have the rapid glyph and layered glyph protection talents alongside the greater glyph ta um, advanced talent, you could um, do some setups that involve multi-target spell going off multiple times in the same turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, that costs a lot of spell points. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, this is this is a at your own risk kind kind of thing. But um, how would you, how would you ha how would you handle some something like um, type cycling? Well, what do you mean by that? Because that's not something I've usually seen in my ex in my MTG experience. Um. Type cycling first showed up as land cycling in Scourge, mm -hmm. and would expand would expand further in Future Sight and Alara. Mm -hmm. um, basically, basically, it'd be worded as type cycling, and then the cost. When the cost is paid, you discard the card, then search your deck for any card that contains that subtype and put it in your hand. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few ways to do that. Um, most notably. Um... There is the wild card um, talent, which uh, the yeah the wild card deck manipulation, which allows you to put specific cards into your hand that um, have no use on their own, but can be played in order to pull another card from your deck. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to have like things that are like simultaneously wild cards with recycling, and also things like lands or creatures. Um, it's possible to do that with the um sub with the deck with the um fused card deck manipulations in this book. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm now, with that with that in mind, I'd I'd like to shift into how into how we how you'd integrate certain mechanics from Yu-Gi-Oh. And for the sake of my sanity, uh -huh. I'm only my cutoff point for this is the five D's era. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. That's as far as I um. That's as far as I like looked into things as well. Although I'm not nearly as familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh as I am with Magic. I'm familiar with both, but um, the reason I say for the sake of my sanity is there are certain at after the after five Ds there are certain um, mechanics and certain complexities that really get that really got out of hand over the years, mm -hmm. and. It's got, and I've I've seen people play Master Duel, and some of the card chains are just absolutely ridiculous, to the yeah. point where it where it takes several minutes for someone to to do their turn because they because they have this long 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 ass chain mm -hmm. of of effects. Yep. But I suppose the I suppose the fir the first thing to co to cover is. How you would handle trap cards? Um, well, um, I actually specifically included a talent called um, a feat called trap card, <laughs> um, which is essentially what you can do is that um, as a standard action, you can just put down a card face down and name the condition that w um, when it'll go off and. Basically, like when that happens, um, you can like flip up the trap card, and the spell immediately takes effect. Mm -hmm. And this can be done with like any spell that you can put in your deck. So it is very possible to get creative with them. Yeah. Uh, I suppose the other the other one I'd be curious about it because of how universal of a of a rule this is. Is um, is is both doing the doing the face down monster thing as well as flip effects. Mm -hmm. Well, um, like flip effects, like effects that occur when the monster is revealed, or yes. um, 
Mm -hmm. That one was a bit of a tricky design problem to solve, but fortunately, um, I had just the um, connect, um, the chain of abilities to pull it off. Um, with the, um, let's see here, improved explosive companion feat. Um, there is already a talent called explosive companion and the, um, um, and the destructive companion feat, which allow you to, um, activate spells from the destruction sphere when a creature is removed from the field. But with improved explosive companion, um, if you have the feats for it, you can activate an effect automatically when a creature enters the field as well. Mm -hmm. So... If you are willing to spend the feats and the spell points on it, you can essentially set up like any combination of effects to occur when one of your creatures hits um hits the hits the deck. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm Now being like the field of battle. And oh the common the common approach that ends up happening when it comes to feats is not with mm -hmm. feats with um with with monsters that have a flip effect is them being put being put in in um fa in face down defense and mm -hmm. activating that when some but when they get flipped over when when they get attacked so i'm curious yep. how you'd handle it in the, in that counter attack manner mhm mm it's um <clears throat> It's pretty like you can you can cut you can set like any number of conditions for a trap card. So you could just declare that like the effect um goes off as soon as like one me or my, like the summon occurs when me or my teammate is attacked by the enemy. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm or like if the enemy moves it in like to this specific space or through this area, then that's when it flips up and wrecks havoc. Yeah. In that in that same in that same regard, um, uh, one of the th one of the things that appealed to me when it came to something like Yu-Gi-Oh was ha was having a limited um, board space because mm -hmm. you can only have five monsters and only five um, back row cards. I'll I'll say, yeah. Obvi obviously, there's stuff like fields and and extra decks, which mm -hmm. I'd say fields would be e would be easy to. Um, imp implement. Yeah, the war sphere, the fate sphere, the protection sphere. Mm -hmm. Um, those are all like filled with a, like basically global effects. Yeah, but when it but when it comes to that limit that rule of five limitation, how would you handle that as a drawback? I considered that, but um, ultimately, I think the um issues that I. I didn't really like feel the need for um that kind of specific limitation because like it's very very rare for players to have that many minions on the field at once even the most dedicated summoners I've seen usually only go for like 3 or 4 um mostly because that's th that's th essentially 3 or 4 more character sheets that you have to manage yes and I feel like um, basically like giving extra spell points or extra feats for some kind of effect that limits the number of spells that you can have on the field. Um, like aside from like the limitation of you can only have one. I feel like that would be too exploitable because to my knowledge, I like only at high levels do I see like an individual character dropping like more than five different buffs on themselves using their own talents. Mm -hmm. Um like in a like in a highly coordinated party, you will definitely see like 20 something buffs that like three or four are applied by each player. But um like for one individual character, which um like I originally designed decks to be like on a per character basis, although it is possible for um if you have certain feats to like have multiple players shuffle their decks into the same one and to play out of it together. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, um, like basically trying to, um, trying to like manage the number of spells or creatures you have on the field in terms of drawbacks feels like it'd be too gameable or, um, too restrictive. Yeah. 
in that regard, how would you, how would you handle the leveling rules as in regard to um need in regard Ooh. to needing to um sacrifice not just not just sacrifice uh, monsters to to bring out higher level ones, but also the fact that there's a li there's a limit to the level of monster you can summon right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that's what the ramp up drawback is for. Um, you're limited. Um, you're limited in how many spell points you could spend on the first turn of combat, but that amount goes up every successive round. Mm -hmm. And as for basically bringing, I'm um, requiring you to like get rid of smaller creatures. Um, that's exactly what tribute of essence is for. And I'm ge I'm guessing tribute of essence can apply just as much to th to things like fusions or rituals or synchros. Absolutely. Basically anything that anything that would mm -hmm. be in an extra deck. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, the um there is a specific talent in here that um a specific feat that specifically allows you to play using an extra deck. And in in that regard, I'd like to ta I'd like to tackle the three th the three items that I mentioned individually to s and see how it how it could be represented. The first one, of course, being fusion, needing the fusion materials yep. and then needing the polymerization spell. Mm -hmm. uh, that one is pretty straightforward. Um, you can just make the polymerization spell the um, fuse um, the fuse talent from the alteration sphere. Uh, all right, I can. Um, I remember in um, Five Ds there was the introduction of super polymerization, which is basically polymerization, except it's a except it was a um, quick play spell instead of a instead of a standard one. Mm -hmm. That's what quicken spell is for, mm -hmm. and also the prodigy um, immediate action casting. Yeah, finisher. Um, rituals had it that had it that you were. Instead of requiring specific monsters, just that you had it had to be of a level total and had to and had to use a ritual spell. So how would you handle that? Um, the thing about ritual spells is that they are definitely more. Uh, they are very much a case by case basis, given that um, like different monsters can have radically different ritual summons. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, the way I would handle that is I would use the technique crafting rules. Um. The technique rules um, originally introduced in Spheres, um, Champions of the Sphere Study and Practice um, mm -hmm. allow you to create some piece, um, some like rather complicated high-cost, high-intensity effects that merge diff multiple different spheres together. And um, this um, and the technique um, rules in Card Casting 2 allow you to do a lot more with them and also provide examples of how they can interact with your deck. So it is very possible to like create some kind of technique that would be that would simulate the complicated chain of events that would be needed for a ritual spell. All right, I I can get that. Um in that same and that bri that brings me to synchro, which the whole thing with that was once again a once again a level total with one of the um one of the components having to required to be a um sometimes a, a specific creature. yeah sometimes a specific tuner mm -hmm. so in that regard how would you handle something like that um for tuners uh way I would handle that would be the deck bound companion feat which um gives you access to specific talents um not based on what cards you have in your hand, but what creatures you already have summoned. Mm -hmm. So um, you could have um, a deckbound companion that is that gives uh, mass alteration and fusion from the alteration sphere, and you could effectively use that as your tuner. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> in re in. In reg in regard to that, when I'm guessing that the level the level component is once again just the, just implemented through the ramp up drawback. Yeah, through the ramp up drawback. Um, I was gonna a you kind of already answered this, but I was gonna ask how the compatibility level with 
um, Champions, since Champions is basically the um, Gish <laughs> version of Spheres. Yes, it is absolutely possible to build a card cast in Gish. Um, like, for example, you could do... Um, the Archer example that I mentioned earlier it was, I believe, a Mage Knight um, mm -hmm. who, like, had different spells that he was drawing and firing attached to his arrows. Um, mm -hmm. The Fortified Spellweaver is... Um, and actually, the card weaver are both um, are both characters that utilize um, magic in um, that use card casting in conjunction with um, physical combat. And the fact that like card casting can be attached to literally any class means that you could absolutely have a paladin who um, is using cards as the basis for their abilities or a mage knight who is who um like is playing things to um do stuff like add combat talents or hit touch ac mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if now, a class uses mm -hmm. spell points it can be used with card casting yeah now now um taking the, taking that into into account into account uh-huh um have you had any situation where where some where you a character was using both spell points and martial focus while being a card caster? I have not um had those in play, but I do uh, but I have accounted for like how those might work mm -hmm. and um they are fully compatible. Um I did do a sample build which was um a yeah, it was a fortified spell weaver who was using the destruction um, berserker and duelist spheres um, to add various effects to their um, to their melee strikes, and it worked swimmingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you go down, you notice that the sample character um, who I should, I'm not going to mince words it's it's based on Tezzeret from Magic: The Gathering. Mm -hmm. um, he uses both combat spheres and magic spheres in uh, and in addition to card casting. Yeah. Uh, now in th now take taking that into account since you since you already used one planeswalker as an example, I'm curious how you'd in how you'd implement um everyone's fa everyone's favorite pyromaniac Chandra. Chandra, oh boy. Um, one of my um, players in my weekly game is very fond of Chandra decks. Mm -hmm. So I've gained an intimate familiarity with how most of her cards work. Um, but um, a lot of the stuff that I did with her was, uh, um, was using the Destruction Sphere in conjunction with... Um, Magic replication from the Mana Sphere and the Glyph talents from the Protection Sphere to essentially like set off triggers that cause more destruction when a destruction ability is activated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the um, ability that I mentioned earlier that like can be used for tuner creatures could also be used for Planeswalkers. Um, essentially, as long as this creature is on the field, you can use specific magical abilities every turn. Yeah. In that regard, c continuing on the Planeswalker thing, how would you handle um, Gideon? Ooh, which one? Um, I don't actually play a lot of white decks, so... Um... Uh, for, the sa for the sake of this, I'll go with um, Gideon Battleforged. All right, then. If you'll excuse me, I actually need to look that one up on Scryfall quick. Um... Here we go. Hidden, hidden. For the plus two ability that, like, force um again for planeswalkers, we can use the um uh, we can use the deckbound companion feat and. For Gideon, I think like some of the. Abilities that would work really well would be um, essentially just gi um, giving it the um, charm in order to um, goad targets mm -hmm. from the mind sphere. 
And um, for granting targets indestructible, um, I mentioned earlier the protection sphere or possibly like just fighting defensively could emulate that reasonably well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. One of the other big one of the other big ones that we see that we see quite a bit in a lot of me a lot of media with magic is Jace. How would you handle oh, him? Oh yes, him his whole thing is is mind fuckery. <laughs> Actually, um, if you look through the control caster feat, you'll notice that one of the abilities is specifically named after the most iconic Jace card. That being mind sculpt. Mm -hmm. Um. Essentially, like, when you charm a creature, you can force that creature, if they have a um, deck, to shuffle a card from their hand into their deck. And if they fail to shave against a powerful charm, you can force them to shuffle their entire hand into their deck. Yeah. It is... There is absolutely some mindfuckery that you can do with that. And um, meanwhile, some of the other... Um, Draw-based abilities used in other Jace cards, or looking, or the scrying effects, can be emulated with many of the deck manipulations. Um, how would you, are you familiar at all with um, Ajani? Which Ajani? There are like twelve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the sake for the sake of the of this, um, we'll just use Ajani Goldmane. Mm-hmm. Let's see here. What's that one? Um, I am so glad I have Scryfall up. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, two, um, yeah, just gaining life like could easily just be a life sphere. Um, putting plus one counters on creatures um, is um, and and giving them vigilance is absolutely an enhancement sphere ability. Mm -hmm. Um. Especially since and, vigilance just means you can attack without having to tap. Yeah. Creating like creature like creating extra summons with power and toughness based on your life total. That that's harder to emulate. Um, but I, I think I'm, the I'm guessing that you would probably base it in, instead of basing it on on the equivalent of life, which would be HP, you'd base it on caster level. Yeah, I imagine that you could probably just um, have a con yeah use deckbound companion to grab a essentially like a conjuration sphere effect that like you can only summon while a Johnny is in play, mm -hmm. or just building a technique that is based around um, oh since it can be done multiple times, maybe make it a um, enhancement sphere animate object effect. Yeah, I could, I could see, I could see that. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, when it comes, one of the other, one of the other characters that get that shows up a lot, um, especially when needing a, um, a black deck representative is Liliana Vets. I was guessing you were going to say either Liliana or Soren. Um. Uh, tempting, yeah. but I don't want to make a bunch of vampire jokes. And a lot, yeah. a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff I see with Soren is all is all about messing with the the life total of of um, allies and enemies. Well, actually, I covered both of them. Um, for Soren Markov, I um, created an ability based on um, one of one of his signature um, Planeswalker abilities, Vasculation, which is a Death Sphere effect that, if the target fails their Fortitude save, um, they are immediately dropped to or increased to half their maximum HP. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, it's augmented form of visceration, which can force the target to fall to one HP. <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. For Liliana, I created a feat that is, bar um, that is based on her minus six from Liliana the Veil, Bargainer's Counterspell. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you can reduce the cost of a counterspell um, effect by one in order to divide up the count um, the effects that you counterspell and force the opponent to choose which ones they keep. Yeah, I can I can certainly go with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and there there is one there was one there was one type of ability that I remember I remember having some debate about and, and because of how how much this changes how someone uses their de their deck I'm curious how you'd handle um the epic rule um cuz ep oh ep the one where you can only cast that one spell for the rest of the fight mhm mm oh boy well i I think that would really have to be just a completely voluntary thing on um, um on you, but it is, would be absolutely possible to build a character that is um, really only capable of casting one spell in a whole bunch of different varieties, or like once you have certain effects, you could um, essentially just like use all of your deck manipulations to like keep churning out that same effect repeatedly. Mm-hmm getting rid of your other cards in order to facilitate that. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I was going to ask about channel, but I can but I think channel is an easy one to figure out since it's basically a secondary effect where mm -hmm. that costs some it it would cost some mana and you'd have to discard the creature, but it would Yeah. do it's basically it's basically you mm -hmm. using the creature as a living bomb. <laughs> yes, that's what the fusion. Ta um, that's what the fused card ability is for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, if you um, basically just don't want to spend the spell point to keep a conjured creature out, you can just um, essentially like summon it and then just have its effect go off, and then it's immediately gone. Yeah. Now, given given how a lot given how a lot of um, a lot of decks are potentially go going to going to lean into summoning how how do you make sure that um somebody isn't overwhelmed when it comes to the amount of mini character sheets that they may have to manage well generally um spheres is much is generally much more contained in its summoning and like if you're bringing in a lot of different creatures like the more creatures that you bring in the more resource intensive it is to actually commit feats to them um so generally, um, with um, like unless you're using the summoner class, um, the um, or like the or something like the encanter or wizard who just has a ton of talents, you are naturally limited in um, how distinct and how powerful each of your companions can be. Yeah, has and has anyone utilize has anyone utilized the this particular um, this partic this particular syst this particular card casting system to do a um um arm a armorist or an el or even an elementalist uh i have not seen an armorist but i i think i would really i would love to see um what somebody could do with that like drawing cards and um, like depending on what cards they draw, producing like different weapons and armor that they have. Mm -hmm. um, an elementalist would be more straightfor um, a more straightforward thing, essentially like basically where each one is a different blast. Yeah, especially um, si especially since the the elementalist yeah. is the most no frills cl class in spheres of power. Yeah. Um, well, at least except for maybe the um, except for maybe the encounter, depending on how you play it. But um, the I I would love to see like somebody go wild with a card casting armorist to basically like at the start of every fight they draw a like hand of all the different weapons and armor they could use and like are like swapping them out on the fly based on what um stuff their opponent is doing. Mm -hmm. That um, sounds really cool. Yeah, and I'm I was get I was gonna ask if somebody had used this with the um with the Mage Knight, but you already answered that. Mm -hmm. Um, and with a lot of the other ones, I can see I can see them being used, even if some of them would be a bit a bit more interesting than uh, than others, like like somebody using card casting as a uh, symbiote. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just a group hug deck. <laughs> I was. A sim, a symbiote, or e or even a um, 
even a wraith. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, the wraith would be like tricky to handle, but um, that could be cool. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, playing a um, Memnarch style deck that is based around use- utilizing what your opponents have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even when I I also think I also think that if so- that I was going to bring up elicitors, but that but that's basically di- dipping into the territory that I, that we already mentioned with um with char- with a, with a character like Jace mm-hmm. since. Well, elicitors are 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 mind fuckers, and and that's what Jace is. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so problem solved there. And when it comes to when it comes to cha- when it comes to champions, um, uh-huh. there's a there's a few that I think would be would be interesting to to see how someone would um would ha- would handle that would handle them. I think one of the big one of the big ones for for me is the crim how someone would handle the crimson dancer <laughs> mm. as a as a card caster um are you talking about in terms of lore or in terms of gameplay um, um more the more the latter than the former the the for the former that that's easier to work with yeah not easy but easier <laughs> I'm actually kind of envisioning something like von Hohenheim, where like he has like all these people inside of him, and he has to like communicate with them, and um, in order to get them to help him. And so basically, like the cards could like represent like different skills or abilities that come up, mm-hmm. um, at, um, t- um, over time, and he has to adapt with like what is most usable. Yeah. Um. Or. For... The... Yeah, for the Crimson Dancer itself, I'm looking at the abilities that it has um, that utilize spell points, and um, like you can definitely do some stuff with the Blood Sphere casting, but um, also some shenan- shenanigans involving um, cards that use bonding blood and um, some of the um, Vitae abilities um, that require spell points. Yeah. I will I will note that yeah the crimson tempest um the ma- the main thing that comes to mind lore wise when tr- when it comes to using this sort of a this sort of card casting with a armorist is and is any manner of togusats heroes who ha- who have mul- who have multiple fo- have multiple forms I already um mm-hmm. something something like double or o's and if if um if I have to go into um, el- elements outside of Common Rider, something like something like say the um, I season mm-hmm. two of the of the of the old '90s Iron Man cartoon, mm-hmm. where he had a bu- where he had a bunch of armor transformations for different yeah. environments. Um, I was thinking sort of something similar to like early Ben Ten, where like he didn't really like. Oftentimes, the Omnitrix would like turn against him and would only like provide access to specific aliens, or um, like it would sometimes just like throw out a random alien and force him to improvise with whatever like he turns into. Mm-hmm. As well, and of course, the time limit factor. Yeah, indeed. Where after after running out of time, the the thing is, pr- the thing is pretty much dead in the water for a while mm-hmm. until it feels like, <laughs> um, g- b- feels like working again. Yeah. Uh Now, and of course, I'm, I'm assuming that when you when you say that you're talking really early, like se- season one, Ben Ten. Yes, I'm talking like season one, Ben Ten, mm-hmm. when he was like basically just figuring it all out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly I can certainly see it, and the f- the fact that the aliens are gr- are separated into sets of ten, at, as was revealed later on, mm-hmm. is going to make somebody's job managing those forms a lot easier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I definitely like that there's a variety of of potential abilities 
with with this and and potential mm-hmm. avenues, even with even with decks that I that I already have from from other stuff, like the Fortune deck from Everway. Yeah, um, the Fortune deck would be tricky to work with, but the Season deck would be a little bit easier. Mm. I'm not familiar with Everway. Um... So, Everway is a interesting game. It was, it was something that was that was put out by by Wizards of the Coast originally. This was this is really early Wizards of the Coast, um, mm-hmm. and it's kind it's kind of considered a predecessor to a lot of the story game ideas because even though it uses a deck it's not a deck in the pass fail kind of way but more in a mm-hmm. what happens next kind of way i yeah. i did a review of its silver anniversary edition a while back mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah i this is making sense um i've seen a few different story games that have used decks in similar ways um mm-hmm. but i'd say that the um there are definitely like ways that this could be integrated into like card casting. Like for example, um, you could do like a nature, weather, war, fate sphere character who um, more or less like shapes their magical abilities like based on what what cards they draw and is an expert at like just twisting the environment in creative ways or just straight up altering other people's destiny or actions they can take. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. that's certainly one possibility. That's certainly one possibility. Yeah. Uh, and of course, of course, I've 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 seen some I've seen some characters have have abilities that that kind of tr- that kind of treat the de- a deck like a deck of playing cards. Mm-hmm. Um, would that be would that be fe- would that be feasible if so- if somebody wanted to integrate a standard playing card deck into say how effective their spells are totally mm-hmm. there are actually a few specific abilities that are tied to um w- w- um that are tied to using basically like an existing deck of cards to determine what ability what talents you have access to in um the um in card casters gamble because the when they released the harrow deck um the um uh, pa- Paizo um, actually like wrote up rules for like using a conventional card deck as a Harrow deck, mm-hmm. and um, using the Harrowed capability and Harrowed talent feats, it'd be totally possible to like crack open a standard fifty-two card deck and then use that for flexing your abilities around in combat. I can I can certainly get behind that. Mm-hmm. Now, I know I know that the that um the ga- the book was supposed to was supposed to come out today but but um because of the typo it had it had to get pulled when do you when do you plan on releasing it well it um i am happy to announce that it is actually on sale and the typo and um crash problems were resolved during our conversation <laughs> it is now up online and i um just sent you the link so right. So by th- mm-hmm. by the time th- by the time everybody's able to see this or hear this, then they'll be able to pick it up. Mm-hmm. And I will certainly put the link in the description. Mm-hmm. But with all that sa- with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and putting up with the <laughs> with with the with the um, most cur- most cursed bit of timing that we've had to deal with because. Right when we were supposed to do this interview weeks ago, but then I got sick. Mm-hmm. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. Mm-hmm. I am very glad to have um, been able to share this project with you, and I am really excited to. Oh um... uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm really excited to see um, what players and dms end up doing with it Mm -hmm. um one of my players as soon as she saw this like came up with the idea of um 
just recreating her modern deck um, completely in card casting and then using it as a boss fight in her own campaign. And I find that hilarious. And I I will be looking for I will be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how it's set up or even if even if somebody puts up a um, MSC mm -hmm. file with their particular yeah. deck, which might I actually make would... a, might actually make for a good contest on your Discord. Oh, absolutely! That would be um that would be hilarious. Um, especially given and... some of the user created um sets. That you already see on um, yeah. Magic Set Editor's forums. Yep, I've gotten into that space myself. Mm -hmm. um, most re mm -hmm. most recently, the High Noon one. Uh huh. But anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. All As right I often then. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yep. And I have a certain other project that is very near to its completion um, and will be releasing as a Kickstarter, hopefully sometime within the next two months. All right. And I will likely be very interested in talking about that more when that finally comes around. All right. I'll, keep, I'll certainly keep an eye out, as I always do. Mm -hmm. But... And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to come on to the show and enjoy the madness at play around here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Zah!